I I don't know how you got roped into being the wedding planner. How did that happen? Have you met me? <laughs> this is true. You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 495 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined today by Mr. Seth Miller. Foz is, uh, I think Foz is flying this morning, actually. Really? Yeah, he's in the air. I don't know where he's going. I never know where Foz is going. Does Foz know where Foz is going? I think sometimes. Every now and then. Um, got a lot. Before we get into the topics, I have a question for you. Uh-huh. In so much as this is episode 495. Yes. You have a favorite Interstate 495 that you would like to dedicate it to? 495. I'm trying to think if I know a four. I mean, that's, they're all on the East Coast, right? Because 95 is on yeah. the East Coast. Uh, probably Baltimore. Okay. The tu- Is the tunnel? Was the tunnel in 495? I think, I think so, yeah. If that's the one I... If that's uh, not the one I'm thinking of. Oh, is that... Okay, so then that's not the one I want, because I liked the tunnel. Yeah, I know. Uh, We're a couple of years from that one still. Let's see. 295 is Richmond. You got the Beltway in D.C. You got the Long Island Expressway. You've got a Beltway around Boston. I'm not sure if Pennsylvania's got a 495 near Philly or not. The Long Island Expressway is the one that goes uh, through lower Manhattan. Is that right? Uh, is that- uh, Midtown Tunnel. Midtown in- Tunnel. Okay, I'll go with that one then. I think, All right. I, th- I mean, I, I think they should remove it, but uh, and I'm going to get, get tweeted. Right. Please, please don't tweet me. Um, I, it's interesting that you picked that one, and only because uh, we got super nerdy about things. The even numbered three digit, like a starts with yeah. a four, or for the two starts with a six, whatever, are supposed to be loops, while the odds are supposed to be spurs. And four ninety five is both an odd number and a spur, so it's special in many ways. You know, it's an even number. Or in a spur. Excuse me, even and a spur, which makes it special in many ways. Yes, yes. So it doesn't it doesn't apply the rules, right? Like it, right. Uh, what it, what it's supposed to be, and then it doesn't really loop around Manhattan. It just kind of avoids Manhattan. Right. The lack of loop is why it's yeah. yeah so what's so. what's yours? What's your favorite? Um, you know, I I have to say at this point probably uh the DC Beltway. See, I don't know that I've taken the Beltway that much. I have to look. Um, I mean, I guess I, if you're going to Tyson's, if you're going to Dulles, I guess from DC you. I had to get on it at some point. You know, the Dulles has a separate toll road, so you might. It depends on where you start. And um, yeah, 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 the toll road is different. Anyway, terribly useless conversation. But, um, I I kind of like it though because I have taken it. I've taken the. I mean, you've been on bits of it. I would assume at some point. I I get on it like if we go from DCA to my family in Bethesda, you're on it for like a hot second, depending on which route the driver. Yeah, pays. I t- so from Reagan, I would take. I'd have to. I had to go into Maryland. Um, yeah. And I would go down, you know, through Alexandria and get on 495 there. Yeah, like if you go to like the east side of Maryland a little bit. Yeah. So I had to cross into Maryland there and then go down. What is that? 210 or whatever on the way to like, uh, yeah. I, can't remember the name of, I can't remember the name of the town now even. Um, look at it. Yeah. yeah. Ryan's Road or something down that way. So, cool. yeah, uh, yeah. I, that's a cool bridge. I think it had a cool uh, view of, of oh, yeah, yeah. ECA when you would come in. Yeah. I thought that was neat. That was neat. Um, yeah. Now that we've spent five minutes talking about absolutely useless things, what's on our topic list today? Uh, let's talk about Newark, since we were just talking about the Northeastern roads, but we can talk about air air roads, okay. air routes. Uh, N90, which is the control, I guess, center for Newark. Yeah. Is, well, has what for New York, the New York area? New York area has moved to Philadelphia. The, they took the Newark part out of N90 and moved it to Philly for yep. the Transcon services. And so. The theory here is N90 is woefully understaffed. We've talked about this a lot. It's been ongoing for a while. But N90 is woefully understaffed. Philly is only slightly understaffed. And they think that they can move that airspace over and have it managed better. And we've talked, I don't know how much on the show, but certainly offline as well, about like when things go sideways, which this past weekend has been a weather nightmare in the Northeast. So yep. uh Plenty of planes diverted from JFK and Newark on Saturday night and never to Boston and never made it uh, back down into New York area, which is bad for everyone. But, uh, you know, all of those things, one of the challenges was like if they have to do sort of the non standard routes, routings, the roadways in the sky, and mm-hmm. uh, 90 typically tended to favor whether it favored or it was just easier to work with LaGuardia and JFK and Newark seemed to be getting short, the uh, short shrift there. Part of that just may be the, the availability of more over water space out east that they could just use as, you know, open area to move the planes and it's harder to get them back across Manhattan and then down into Newark or something. I don't know. But I'll, I'll play Foz. It's all because of Teterboro. Uh, 
they hate because they're protecting Teterboro because they hate Teterboro. I think they hate Teterboro. I mean, I think Teterboro causes a lot of problems for Newark arrivals from the north, regardless mm-hmm. and, and departures to the to the north, um, going west or whatever, because you have to yeah. go over Teterboro, and it just causes it, it, if there's conflicting traffic, it slows everything down, and so. Yeah. I think it's it's a problem. Uh, to be clear, N90 is the Tracon. It's one of the level yeah. twelve, okay. one of the seven largest Tracons in the United States. Yeah. So anyway, they're they're moving it over. There's been it moved over last week, or I guess now two weekends ago, the weekend of July twenty eighth or whatever that was. Um, and now uh, it's maybe better, sort of done. I mean, it's done. The question is, is it working yet? In the first couple of days, there were certainly some teething pains. There were some limitations on traffic volume based on the staffing, and then. The weather kicked in to also hold things back. But uh Yeah, do we know how it did this? I mean, this we're recording this on Sunday, but yesterday, Saturday was a pretty pretty rough day in the northeast for yeah. air traffic as of weather. Do you know I, how it performed? Yeah, you know, I think that it did my my metric these days is did it do any worse than JFK or LaGuardia? Mm. Right? Like if everything if all three are still terrible, then I can't blame it on the staffing switch. If two are bad and Newark is okay then it's still not working right. And I haven't had a good opportunity to see there. I'd say it's been lagging a small bit. I don't know specifically for Saturday mm-hmm. um, and arguably like what matters more is in the not terrible weather is, can they maintain sort of basic operations, which initially was hard. Um, but I haven't seen anything too terrible yet, but also nothing suggesting it's like going to be smooth sailing. So it'll take some time to get it sorted. Yeah. I mean, I saw like yesterday, some of the map, like some of the, diversions i mean there's a there's quite a few from jfk laguardia and newer i mean there's yeah th- i think there was the planes just couldn't hold long enough to wait for the weather so they just ended up in boston yeah uh, including a lot some. of international diversions at boston and right part of that is especially for an international diversion you try to go to a place that has especially if you and, and especially if you know you're going to be there a while or likely to yep. be there while you try to go somewhere that's got facilities that can handle immigration if you got to get the passengers off yeah uh, boston was I don't know, like 20 or 30 diversions there, all wide bodies or mostly wide bodies. It was part like all the taxiways became parking lots. I would assume at some point they had to tell people, you like, you can't come here anymore. Um, and I guess I'm like eight or 10 planes still didn't get out that night. Yeah, I saw that. There was like a few United wide bodies, Air yeah. Lingus. Yeah, quite a few. Singapore was there for 10 or 12 hours. Oh, I didn't realize Singapore had uh, been diverted. Yeah, one of the 350s. So yeah. not good. Yeah, wow. Uh, like you land in Boston, okay, fine, we get down, and then the weather gets bad in Boston after New York a couple by a couple hours because that's usually the direction the storms move, and then you're stuck, and then you're stuck. Yep. Um, let's talk about Spirit. They are going to yeah. be a normal airline again. Well, normal is relative. <laughs> what? Uh they've unveiled four new pricing bundles, or three of which are new. One, the Go fare is still like their basic economy, no no features, no benefits, no amenities. Um. And if you're lucky, you get to sit inside the plane instead of on the wing kind of thing. Uh, and then they have two new, but there's another one. I, and I'm blanking on the name of the middle, like the second tier up one is a, you get a free bag and you get to pick your seat assignment. And then they're adding a Eurobiz style cabin for, which is go comfy. Um, so no extra leg room, but blocked middle seat, and also includes a bag. And I think includes a non-alcoholic drink on board. Interesting. And, and then go com- uh, go big, which is the new big front seat offering. And so instead of just buying big front seat and then separately buying your bags and drinks and snacks and priority boarding and whatever, big front seat now is alcohol, drinks, snacks, uh, the seat, obviously, um, bags. I think you get checked and carry on. I have to triple check that. And what an interesting and unique thing in the U.S., uh, free Wi-Fi. That is, that is interesting. So it's basically like a first class fare. Yeah. So they, they've. They've rebundled all of their unbundled <laughs> stuff, um, but in a way that's super. In- There's two things about that I find super interesting. One, at least to start, it's not being marketed as a first class fare on meta search engines and OTAs. So, like, if you search for a first class ticket from you know on a market they fly, it doesn't show up, but Delta does or whatever, um, which you'd think they'd want to get that fixed. <laughs> and uh, it's just overall, there- there's no option now to do all the random ancillary buy-ups, all that unbundled stuff. Like you can't buy a go comfy and then decide, you know what? Actually, I want the big front seat and I'm going to book that. And right in the old days, you could either bid up to big front seat or like you could just buy the seat assignment. You could always go in and manage your reservation. Like, ah, I want that better seat. I want the leg room seats. I want the whatever. And you could just buy it. Now 
you know, the, the, I asked about that and they told me they're working on figuring out how to support that ancillary buy up going forward, but, uh, it's not there yet. Huh. So, which ties into that. They, they, it's also interesting. They announced it a couple days before their earnings call. That's interesting. Rather than doing it as part of the earnings announcement where, um, you know, they lost money. Um, so you might want to distract, but whatever they, but during the earnings call, I would say partially because of what I just described as like, you know, losing this other, this revenue potential for the up sales. And then just sort of also all the other things, um, they said, you know, we're facing a lot of headwinds, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, part of this GTF engine problems and all those other things. But they said they're, they expect to see like a three to 4% headwind based on not having the new brand sales stuff fully in the marketplace and properly advertised to passengers yet, but, and not being able to sell the ancillaries. But if you give them long enough, eventually they should see about a 15% increase in revenue as a result of it. Hmm. So, right. Like the passenger who just wants the big front seat and used to be happy paying for just the big front seat and, you know, didn't drink on board, but now is going to get charged up because of the bundle or whatever. Like you could see how that will trend towards assuming enough people keep buying it total revenue being higher or revenue per seat being higher. It's, it's an interesting situation, but it takes away a lot of the flexibility for passengers. And so will the same number of people buy a front seat, big front seat, if now instead of $79, it's one nineteen because you also get, you know, free drinks and a free bag or one fifty nine because you now get free drinks and a free bag that you, maybe you didn't need. Did, I mean, have you looked at the price? I mean, have they released the prices? I guess they haven't released the pricing yet. So I'm sort of making up the numbers. Um, yeah, yeah. Pricing, I think it goes on sale on August 16th. Okay. So I'll give them credit. They're rolling it out super fast. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, if you had seen what it, it, you know, what it means for pricing just as a whole. Like, is it still kind of staggered? Is it still is yeah, it they, step based? You know what I mean? It, it will still be step based, I'm sure, but they have not released the prices yet. Oh, so so that, to wait and see. Yeah. And that, that also, though, sort of go to your point about sort of step pricing and whatnot, you know, uh, for the LCCs and depending on who, you know, some of the regular airlines are sort of removing this direction as well, the sort of like up fair mm. concept, right? Of like the base fare for Fort Lauderdale to Boston is $79. If yeah. I want to go to the next tier up, it's 119. The next year is 139. And the what next year is 179 kind of thing. And it's not fair buckets so much as different bundles of amenities and you know, the first one is twenty dollars the second one is 50 and the third one is 80 or whatever those number you know differentials are yep uh, would potentially make it harder for them to sell that as a first class ticket in the sense that it, they don't have that sort of built into their marketing and distribution platform right now hmm. so that may be why it's not showing up because they don't have the tech stack sort of that can push that to those third parties yeah yeah i mean that's because it is again that that's pretty I wouldn't say complicated. It's just, it's different. So yeah, yeah, it's gotta be a big deal. Yeah. Um, Rex, the Australian airline is bankrupt. It, uh, they've halted their 737 operations as okay. a, this is right. Rex was regional express. I think that's what the name comes from. And so they used to fly a bunch of props around milk runs across Australia, a lot of little markets, things like that. And we're kind of doing okay. Um, COVID hit. Some 737s became readily available. Like, yeah, let's give this a go in the uh, big city markets and like tried to grab market share on the uh, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney triangle. You know, go after Qantas and Virgin Australia. Yep. uh, Who had way more capacity, ability to better manipulate fares and dump and whatever. Uh, Just it was a bold move, uh, as they say, and uh, it did not pay off well for them. Hmm. So it's an interesting situation now you got uh because they invested as much as they did in that trying to sort out can they extricate the 737 ops and get back just to their core regional you know prop operations can those be saved in a yeah. manner that's you know good for the consumers and good for the country and in a lot of markets you know they, there's a one story i was reading suggesting you know oh it's because australia is a failed tourism market or failed aerospace market kind of thing and it's like I mean, sure, you could, you could look at it that way, but there's a little bit of sort of crazy around, can, it, do they need to be able to have, you know, access to those bigger markets in a way to compete versus if they go out of business in the small markets, like tourism dies, but also in a lot of those places. And like one of the anecdotes was a guy who runs a outback train tour where like you fly out to a small town, stay there for a couple nights, then three nights on a train and then fly to another small town and then fly back kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do the markets that, only Rex was serving. Um, 
And then there's just the sort of general people live in markets that only rec serves. Australia is a very large physical space with a lot of desert and unpopulated areas in the middle. And air travel is, in many cases, the, I don't want to say only, but certainly the best way to get it, get some of that connectivity, certainly for emergencies, healthcare, like, you know, medevac kind of stuff. So, you know, you don't medevac on a commercial flight, but like, yeah. I have to go in, I have to go to the big city for treatment, uh, you know, my regular chemo treatment or whatever. Right? I don't need a medevac for that, but I do need an airplane to get there. Yeah. I mean, it, this is, I, I think there's a, there's a real lack of competition within Australia, right? And this means there's less competition now. Yeah. It, it, That's a right. problem. Well, the question is, is just having Virgin Australia and Qantas competing in those sort of core trunk routes, is that insufficient for the market? Um, and, you know, anyone will say, well, prices are high. Well, I'm sure they are. Do they need to be to actually cover the cost of delivering the service? Maybe or maybe not. Um yeah, you, know, you, you start getting into some of those discussions. You know, there was a couple of our couple friends were having like a debate. You know, someone was complaining that like three ninety nine round trip from Phoenix to Dallas was too much or something like that, or San Diego to Dallas was too much. It was like a round trip ticket for under five hundred dollars is probably means you're paying less than it costs to operate that trip in most yeah. cases, right? Like you start getting into some of those debates, and it's like, right, but it's still expensive to me, and we were so used to having access to cheap fares sometimes that yeah, how how do you sort of process all that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like everything's getting a little more expensive and airfare is part of that. And I think people feel like we should be back in the days when it was quite a bit cheaper uh, to fly. I don't I don't know that we'll ever, we'll ever go back to those days. Yeah, I, I, I too enjoy cheap fares, but I like knowing that the business is probably going to still be there when I get we, to the airport. We need to fly. Yeah, exactly. Um, JetBlue is shedding their Europe growth. I feel like I've, I feel like I, this I foreshadowed this. Many shows have to go back and like listen to old episodes. Yes, I was like, I feel like Europe is a losing market for them. I, I think, yeah, really we, yeah, it's it's unclear if Europe specifically is a losing market or they just don't have the money to buy the airplanes anymore mm. uh, as the challenge. But um, they too reported earnings last week and made a tiny bit of money, small profit, which Q two is often the best quarter for the month of the year. So you know, if they only have a small profit, then probably means they might lose money for the year. But um, as part of that, they announced they're deferring a bunch of their new aircraft orders. Okay. I think they were due to get like 45 new planes over the next three years, and those are all now to the end of the decade. Wow. Or to the next decade beyond 2030. So they're going to still finish their A220 fleet and get rid of the E90s. The E90s go away by uh, the end of 2025. Okay. Um, but the A321 Neo growth is going to be postponed about five or six years and that means no more new mint lrs for going to europe and no more xlrs for going even further into europe or not no more no you know they don't have any yet but the xlrs will be delayed significantly as well so hmm. that's a tough one just tough pill to swallow the other interesting thing that i think uh joanna garrity said in their earnings call was sort of to the effect of that's doing really well for us seasonally hmm. right which Shelling. Right. But that's also sort of the anyone can make money going across the Atlantic in the summer, in yeah. theory. Um, and JetBlue sort of seems because we talked about this a little bit last week or the week before, right? Like Boston, Amsterdam had already been suspended. Uh, Gatwick is already suspended for the winter. Um, there was like Paris is dropping a flight from JFK in the winter. So they already saw some of that demand weakening. They're trying to backfill a little bit with the BA code share that they uh, announced a month or so back. But it's going to be really hard to fill all that in. And uh, if you don't have the big planes, then you definitely can't do it. And then like, okay, it works in the summer, but what do I do with those planes in the winter? Yeah. I was going to say like, could they do something like Latin America or South America with those planes and get a premium? South or? America's hard. Cause it's too far. Mm. Right. Like, not, not even Colombia. Yeah. Yeah. You can maybe get to some of those, but like they're, they're shutting down some of those markets. A lot of those markets are yeah. uh, going to get there, but they, um, like Lima is gone now. Um, but I want to say that like even Fort Lauderdale to say Rio mm -hmm. is 4,100 miles and it starts to get a little long compared to like JFK Paris. Uh, yeah, because of the winds. Are so weird. Another 500 miles. It's just, it. so you got to get to the, you got to get to the big, if you got it, well, if you want to get to the big cities of South America. So like Rio, Sao Paulo, uh, Buenos Aires, that air and yep. Santiago is even further. If you want to get to those bigger urban markets, it's hard. And then if you go into the smaller stuff on the north side of the country, you don't get a rich. Yeah, no. I'm trying to see what's JFK Lima. 
Um, well, they're pulling out of Lima as a market in general, but that's 3,600 miles. And I was, I was looking at Fort Lauderdale even to try to help it out. But, um, right. Lima is also one of those weird ones. Isn't Lima the market that like Continental back in the day kept alternating between a 737 and a 757, desperately trying to make premium work and never actually being able to do it? They got, I mean, Newark is still, Newark to Lima is a 752. Okay. Um, and then I think, uh, they were, they were going back and forth on Houston. So I think the tra- like the traffic from there just wasn't, um, premium enough for them so they, they would they would sell it as a regular um cabin uh 737 or it, depending on the day it would be a 752 so you could get a life flat seat but it's only 500 miles shorter than newark really um so it's, it's yeah. 30, 30, 30 100 miles yeah and i remember that was a market that uh was just continental and lima that was a market that you could get a complimentary upgrade right like it yeah. was one of the it was like again not premium enough and JetBlue again, and again, JetBlue is pulling out of Lima wholesale, so they don't see it as even coach demand. So I guess it's where do you put those planes? And so this year, JetBlue is doing like a lot to Phoenix. Phoox and Las Vegas are getting more mint. I'm a little surprised like they're not doing like Cancun or like the west coast of uh, Mexico from JFK or like Boston even. That's a little surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, they I think they tried some of those. Um, Just again, not enough premium traffic. <laughs> Yeah, and I can't remember. I think so, and also some of that was mostly from L.A., which mm-hmm. they were the fifth, you know, fifth place carrier at best, and everybody else was also flying in those markets. So how do you convince them to fly JetBlue instead, other than by price? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so LAX is being scaled back as well. It's just it's a, they're in a tough spot right now. Um, and again, how, is there enough premium demand in any of these places? And as you start getting up into a five, six, seven hour flight, it's got to be a real premium demand, not a you know cheap premium demand yeah yeah um i mean how do you think how do you think just real quick how do you think uh, JetBlue stacks up over the year do you think it's a positive year for them or is is this going to kind of be like uh we got to do something big to fix this because it feels like JetBlue is failing slowly while spirit's failing very quick <laughs> yeah and i think JetBlue is trying to make pretty major shifts pretty quickly it just mm-hmm. doesn't it's harder to see it as quick happening just because they are announcing them sort of in small tranches. Yep. My, um, and product hasn't really changed yet. That'll be the, the inter- other than they added free bags for, uh, they had free, ba- they had free carry ons on their, on their blue basic. So they, uh, yeah. on the basic economy, trying to get a little more of the basic economy traffic, similar to how United's was trying to, you know, boost its basic economy cabin. Yeah. Know, sales. Basically trying to kill off, uh, spirit. Um, which has completely changed its model now. It's the whole industry right now is in upheaval. It's kind of crazy. But I do see JetBlue is definitely trying to change. Um, route network, right? Heavy, heavy refocusing on East Coast and Latin America, Caribbean in the core markets where they always, you know, more Caribbean than Latin America, but in the core markets where they previously have had success, doubling back down on San Juan, et cetera. Um, they're trying, but they've got a weird, with the premium cabin stuff, they've got a weird fleet mix and a lot of challenges. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about Air New Zealand. Uh, they've they've basically given up on their twenty thirty climate goals. Yeah, this is a right. They they're still holding out for net zero by twenty fifty because no one's willing to admit that that's impossible yet. Yeah. But me, and like many airlines, they announced sort of had plans that along the way to get there, we're going to do these other things, and the other things were varied and you know whatever. But like you know, 10% cut by 2030 or something like that en route to net zero and or 10% of all fuel would be SAF or, mm-hmm. you know, different things. And interestingly, I think the Air New Zealand somewhat uh, is possibly the most honest of the airlines. It's like, yeah, we, we, we tried to buy SAFs. There's not enough out there. Even if we wanted to pay the higher price that they're calling for, we can't see a pathway to getting enough of it. Mm. So we're not willing to tell you that we're definitely going to get there if if the thing isn't there um that's one of them and then the other half was that they uh they were putting a lot of their faith in converting from triple sevens to seven eight sevens on a sort of you know reduced fuel burn per passenger kind of thing yeah and even as they're increasing overall capacity trying to reduce capacity you know fuel burn per passenger and because the seven eight seven deliveries are being delayed because Boeing's having trouble building them without you know mechanical flaws that uh that also became a problem and Hmm. so they're we we can't get enough new planes, and the planes that we can get, we can't put the fuel in that we wanted to buy, so we're not going to pretend anymore. We think five years from now is actually not going to be possible to hit those targets, and they're not saying we're not going to try, but it's an interesting sort of honest assessment of where the industry is. Hmm. Do you, I mean, 
if they, if they're gonna like, do you do you think they set a new target and say this is what we really want or what we really think we can achieve? Because you said they're more honest, but I think the more honest thing to do would be to set an actual target at some further date, potentially. Or do you think they just say, we can't set one because we don't know? I, I think they're going to, uh, I don't know what they're going to do long term, but you're right. The longer term, it would be nice if they were like, okay, you know, hey guys, we know back last summer, we pissed everybody off by telling the world that this was impossible. We re-looked at the numbers. We you know, we, could, we don't think we'll hit 10%, but we think we can hit 8%. Now that's reasonable. So that's our new target. Um, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen, but... Uh, it, it's not there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting times. Interesting yeah. times. Um, so they are still holding strong on the 2050. Like, hey, you know, it's just like, well, there'll be a lot of lumps along the way, but we'll just make it to the final. We'll get to the finals, no problem. It's like, you kind of do have to meet some of the interim milestones to hit your final target. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Allegiant, pushing more extra. Yeah, there's a... Uh, Allegiant Extra is the uh what they call their extra legroom product on board and they've got it on a hand not a handful but more than a handful but not their whole fleet it's rolling out and they uh in their last earnings call which was also last week's uh made the point that it's actually performing still continues to perform better and they're they're an interesting airline because i want to say like 75 percent of their routes are still no direct non-stop com- competition uh-huh. right so they still, he, they called a, he, I think their outgoing CEO is like, yeah, we're over here in our own swim lane while everybody else is out there playing water polo. And I don't know if you guys watched that in the Olympics, but those guys fight dirty. Uh, the pretty, which is, I mean, it's water polo is a brutal sport. They go after each other pretty hard. Um, and they're like, yeah, we're just over here in the lane swimming, doing our own thing while all these other companies or airlines are fighting over there. Uh, and it's sort of true and sort of not. But as with everybody else, right? Uh, Spirit pushing more premium seating, JetBlue trying to get people to buy up more to even more space. Yeah, all of those things. Even Allegiant is saying, you know, we're seeing a nice trend of people buying our premium legroom products when they're on board or when they're booking. And so trying to convince the industry that they too have a way to avoid the risk of only, you know, passengers buying only on price and inevitable pressure downward and losing. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so part of that, but at the same time, like the revenue per flight that they're getting as an uh, incremental win has gone down since two years ago when they were sharing some numbers. Like it used, they said a couple of years ago uh, in an interview I did that it was 800 to $1,000 per flight in incremental revenue. And now it's about $500 a flight in incremental revenue, which is still $500 more than they would have had otherwise. Yeah, yeah. But it's not as much as it used to be. So I mean, I, I question recon- the reconciliation of that a little bit, but uh, they're going to have... 13 more of their A320s converted in Q3 and another 13 in Q4. And between those and their new Maxin, which are due to arrive starting, uh, they think, in early September. They're supposed to get four this year. Uh, half their fleet will have the extra legroom product on board. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, That's they've got, good. I mean, it's good for them. For yeah. Sure. And they've got, a, they've got the process in place to sell it. Um, so they think they've got that worked out. I will say, uh, when I took them earlier this year, Mm-hmm. Back in April, I flew them. Right, uh, we sat in reg- we sat in regular legroom seats. I think exit row one way and then regular the other. It was okay. <laughs> it, was, it was it was it wasn't bad. I mean, I I didn't feel like I didn't feel cramped at all. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Um. It, it it part of that is I think the seats were just a little more like had padding in them. So even if it was whatever, like it felt comfortable. Okay. Mm. Like, I wasn't like the sort of ultra slim line bench that you're sitting on. But yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I didn't get paid either one, but. Certainly at the right price, I will buy legroom for myself. Also, you know, I was on a two and a half hour flight, not a LA Grand Rapids five hour or four and a half hour flight. Yeah. I mean, do you think that's the markets where people will mostly, I mean, I mean, it makes sense that they'll pay for that. Yeah. I think Grand Rapids was one of their first test bases. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. For it because the flights from there, it's, it's, you know, up in Michigan and the flights were to some destinations. So the flights were all a little longer. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then Tui, Belgium. Uh, has grounded their E2s on, I guess, engine issues, right? Yeah, the the, the Embraer flies on the Pratt Whitney geared turbofan engines. Uh, the E2s do, and this is a funny one because Belgium basically had to ground its entire fleet hmm. of them. They they couldn't they uh, ran out of spare parts, and they were like That's churning. Right. Yeah, they were churning through parts, try to chase down an excessive oil consumption problem. Okay. Um. And it's unclear exactly what the, or they know when they haven't published it, or they don't know, but it's unclear exactly how and why that's, how that sort of excessive oil consumption is happening. But the planes are having problems. And 
been on the parts. They're like, well, we, we can't fly them anymore. And what ended up happening in the as a result of it is they don't have an Antwerp operation anymore. <laughs> like the E twos were based at Antwerp. Yep. And and I think I thought they had some seven thirty sevens up there too, but maybe not in the summer. I don't know. But like basically Antwerp is shut down for now. Because I, I, wasn't there a Q or a Fokker flight from Antwerp to London City? Oh yeah, that's been gone for a while ago. It comes and goes, but oh, okay. Because we were going to uh, fly it over the winter, and yeah, yeah, that wasn't that's I not, got it a, not two weeks. I got it, yeah, I got it a couple of years ago, also. But yeah, um, yeah, that was one where uh, they've tried off and on, but it. Uh, I the last one had a coach there with KLM to make it happen and try to feed passengers that way. They there's been a lot of different efforts, but. Uh, I think Luxair was operating it when I flew it, so I'd fly in from Luxembourg to Antwerp and then up to London and back. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's what that's what we were going to do. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, but not quite there. So basically, opposite at Antwerp have stopped because of I this. think there's no more commercial service there. I'd have to double check, but yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of sucks. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's convenient. I mean, for people who want to go to those specific destinations, they they flew a lot of weird routes out of out of Antwerp, right? Like yeah, uh, Tenerife. Uh, I think Grand Canary, Tel Aviv, Tangiers, um, Malaga, um, Palma de Mallorca, you know, winter, summer destinations and, and some yeah. you know, stuff. So it's, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, uh, I don't see any commercial flights having departed in the last couple of days. No. No. Wow. Well, well, that's, that's not good. Not good. Um, what do we got? We got Porter to Palm Springs and San Diego from Toronto. Speaking of E2s, uh, they're pushing theirs. They continue to expand their North American footprint. I don't know if those are seasonal. I would guess seasonal, at least for Palm Springs. But yeah. Um, yeah. They, and that's another one they're doing. Uh, that's basically one plane assigned to, I think, San Diego four days a week and Palm Springs three days a week. Oh, okay. So they go out and back and overnights at home and out and back. Or maybe it was a red eye. I don't know. But uh, yeah. But they're for relatively long stage lines. But yeah, it's uh, just finding new places to send their fancy new planes. Yeah, that's that's kind of wild. <laughs> it's just like, hey, yeah. Um, I mean, do you think do you think they stay kind of in these markets where it's like, okay, we can pick up a bunch of leisure traffic because this isn't this isn't business traffic, right? No, this is this is definitely leisure traffic. Um, I think that le- they want they would want to tell you that like they had a huge business wins in the Northeast and like some of their frequent shuttle type services and whatnot. I think the reality is it was mostly leisure traffic, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's where they're more likely to be successful. Is just is just focused on that leisure leisure cost uh, basis, basically. Yeah, I mean it, it makes sense. I just I feel like they are they're like an airline that's like trying to figure out who they are, um, and I'm I'm worried that they are trying to go they're going to go JetBlue. Is yeah, it, you know what I mean, like overstretching. So. Anyway, yeah, it's just interesting. Flair has flown the uh, route in the past. Palm Springs from Toronto. Mm-hmm. WestJet has flown it in the past, but not since 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, Air Canada continues to have it on its schedule as well, all seasonal. So, right, like just showing up and putting your plane, your smaller plane, on the same route that Air Canada constantly is flying, doesn't seem like maybe the best idea. Yeah, uh, Air Canada is a rouge. Uh, is Air Canada rouge to Palm Springs? So oh, interesting. One might argue that, I mean, Rouge, well, they both do. So both would get free Wi-Fi. I think Rouge is, is working in that direction. But, like, does Porter's slightly, you know, 2-2 two, two seating instead of 3-3 three, three and slightly better in a couple of ways, experience bigger windows, whatever, than the old A320s that Rouge is flying? Is that a better experience? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and even if it is, is it enough better that people are going to switch their loyalty and do it? Yeah, fair. Fair. Um, Let's talk about... Port, uh, uh, Azul. Uh, Azul. Yeah. Cur- Curacao to Fort Lauderdale? Yeah, this is a cool one. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's a fifth freedom flight because they're a Brazilian airline flying between the Netherlands Antilles and the United States. Um, but yeah, that uh, route seems to be showing up um, for starting later this year, starting in December. <laughs> uh, they're going to be putting a, uh, I'm trying to dig into the details here. Come on. There we go. Uh, operating on a 174 seat, let's say 737, wow. three or four days a week. Wow, 320. Kind of, are they? I mean, that it's kind of a it's a kind of a weird choice, right, to do this. But I guess there's enough of a market in Fort Lauderdale to to make it work. So I I think that right, like 
Aruba gets all the traffic for that part of the world, but Bonaire and Curacao are right there and have, there's been attempts to get flights into Curacao or Bonaire in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are relatively small markets. And then once you're down there, you can sort of do some island hopping and things like that. But, um, supposed to be amazing places to visit. So I think, I think it's super cool that it's there. I'm not sure I'll get to, I mean, I won't get to go this year, but, um, I did, I give them props for this. I think a couple of days a week on that plane, they might actually be able to make it work. Uh, but it is uh, de- definitely an interesting, different sort of situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of it's kind of interesting to me um, that they it, it's it's a cool way to connect people down to a part of Brazil that's probably not um, yeah reached as much. So, yeah, it was an American flies it. Oh, really? Hmm. Uh, and JetBlue has flown some Curacao in the past. Interesting. Um, this is they still are. So that's interesting. Continental even flew it back in 2011 and 12. I remember. I remember Continental. Um, I didn't realize AA flew it. That's. I don't know. Actually, United still has it on its schedule. Really? Yeah. From Newark. From Newark. Huh. Uh, weekly, once a week. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So there's clearly a market there. Yeah. It's bigger than I thought. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, American is a lot of flights. American is double daily. Uh, like Charlotte and Miami. Wow. And Charlotte is, if I'll get this right, is half the year Miami is uh, double daily most of the year. Interesting. So, bigger mark than I thought. All right. Glad we did some research here. You're welcome, yeah. Rick, you listeners. <laughs> yeah. I think, that's it for the, I think that's it for the main show. Yeah. We got a lot to talk about in the bonus topic for Patreon. So I, need to, talk about I need to go do some research to make sure I do it right. Uh, what do you mean? I don't know. Like, actually report what the markets are before we get to them. Uh, it's okay. I, overrated. I think I think I think the Curse of Florida Lauderdale thing is interesting no matter what. So. Yeah, I still think it's cool to fit freedom route. Yeah, for sure. Um Koreans dropping ramen. We're gonna talk about that in the post uh bonus topics for our Patreon subscribers. Uh the DOJ su- suing Norfolk Southern, um, Air Europa and BA kind of falling apart, um, and the new PDX terminals getting ready to cl- open, and then hundred milliliter rule in Europe is uh kind of a mess. So talk about that a little bit for our patreon subscribers if you're not a patreon subscriber thank you for listening thanks for tweeting us sending us notes we like to hear from you um and uh yeah we'll talk to you next time happy travels take care